Well, good morning, everybody. I see that folks are trickling in, so I'll start at least with the introduction so we have enough time to really uh, discuss with the Reynolds here. It's really a, a privilege for us all to be here together to discuss about this. First, I want to uh, thank our exhibitor, Amgen, uh, for, for supporting our uh, grand rounds. And before I start with Dr. Uh, Reynolds' uh, uh, introduction, really want to use this because it's tied to um, uh, a study that we're participating now, which Dr. Reynolds I will, will be talking about too. We, we're now participating in the HARP uh, study uh, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Reynolds, which is a Minoka study that does three-vessel OCT uh, as, long, as, as, long, as, long, as well as clinical MRI uh, to better characterize these patients. Uh, we are in to the study now. We actually did our first case a couple of weeks ago. So for all of those those of you that are around in seeing these patients, uh, please alert uh, me or, or Dr. Berlakis who are doing this three vessel OCTs. If you have any of these cases, you know, we would be more happy to consider whether they're eligible. Uh, with that, I'll start, you know, Dr. Reynolds, it's really a privilege to have her here with us today. She is uh, the Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She directs the Sarah Ross Sutter Center for, Center for Women's Cardiovascular Research. And she, she is the Associate Director um, of the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center. Uh, she is well recognized and an expert in both myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, Minocum, as well as a stable ischemic heart disease with non-obstructive coronary arteries, and has had a, a research career focus on, on cardiovascular disease in women, as well as testing and treatment strategies for ischemic heart disease in clinical trials. In fact, she was the associate director for the clinical coordinator center for the NHLBI uh, uh, ischemia trial, as well as the principal investigator for the CHOW ischemia study, uh, an H NHLBI funded study addressing the relationship between changes in symptoms and changes in stress test results in patients with ANOCA. Uh, she practices at NYU, um, and it's really a privilege to have her here with us today to discuss her about, um, uh, about my ANOCA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandoval, for that kind introduction, and thank you guys for having me. I would usually say that I wish I could be there with you, but I have a bit of a cold, so I think you're lucky I'm not there. Please forgive me if I sniffle or cough a little bit during this. Uh, so let me share my screen. You can see the slides just fine, right? I'm going to take it as a yes. Um, so I'll talk to you today about multimodality imaging in Minoka. Um, what is MINOCA? There are standardized diagnostic criteria for MI and non-obstructive coronary disease, and they're put out by the AHA, but the ESC has similar criteria. And the diagnosis of MINOCA is really centered on the universal definition of myocardial infarction. So we need somebody with a rise or fall of troponin with at least one value above the 99th percentile upper reference limit, and either symptoms or EKG changes, new wall motion abnormality, something to tell us that this is a cardiac problem. And of course, we have non-obstructive coronary arteries by angiography, and that can range all the way from completely normal vessels to 49% stenosis. That 50% threshold is a little arbitrary, but it has to be set somewhere. And whenever we talk about what Minoka is, we talk about what it isn't. So it isn't a case when you know the alternate cause for that troponin and let's say chest pain or EKG change. So if it's pulmonary embolism, then you wouldn't call it Minoka because you wouldn't call it myocardial infarction. If you see an 18-year-old with influenza, chest pain, and ST elevations, well, you know that's myocarditis. You're not really going to think of MI unless there's some specific circumstance. So we wouldn't call it Minoka just because the arteries don't show a lot of obstructive plaque. Which types of patients get this problem? Minoka disproportionately affects women. There are many studies showing this, but these are just some of the largest. And whether we look at STEMI or non-STEMI, you can see that this is more prevalent among female MI patients and will be seen in 4 to 10% of patients presenting with STEMI who are female and 2 to 8% of the male. When we look at non-STEMI, there will be no obstructive coronary disease at angiography in 4 to 5% of non-STEMI patients who are male. And the most stable estimate is this largest one, that's 15% of women with non-STEMI. We also teamed up with the New York City Chief Medical Examiner's Office and found that in people who had died under the age of 55 with pathologic evidence of an MI, 23% of the females and 16% of the males had no obstructive coronary disease. So Minoka can be a fatal problem as well. Minoka is more common among certain racial and ethnic minorities. 
one of my colleagues, Nat Smilowitz, looked at the actions get with the guidelines registry now called chest pain MI. And we had almost 19,000 Minoka patients in this registry. You can see that Minoka was more common among MI patients who identified as Black African American, Native American, and Hispanic. And Minoka patients were often young. This is the age structure of the Minoka population in that action analysis. We can see that fully a quarter of the patients were aged under 50, another quarter in their 50s, another quarter in their 60s. But 27% were aged over 70, so that even old white guys get Minoka, even though the classic demographic would be, let's say, a young African-American female. Conventional risk factors are common among patients with Minoka. Again, from the Action Get With the Guidelines Registry, the frequency of these risk factors is less than in people who show up and have obstructive coronary disease, but still, there's a 20% likelihood of diabetes among Minoka patients, two thirds have hypertension, half have dyslipidemia. Overall, 75% have at least one conventional risk factor. When encountering this syndrome, clinicians and patients will ask, was this really an MI? What's the treatment and what's the prognosis? Let's start with the prognosis. Um, in several studies, we see that Minoka patients have a prognosis that is intermediate between MI with coronary disease and people who never had an MI at all. And most studies will show what I'm showing you here. In this case, it's two-year death or MI. And patients with Minoka who have normal coronaries on angiography or those with mild coronary disease prove to generally have a similar prognosis. So it's not a good thing to have. And major adverse cardiovascular events definitely accrue. Here's one of the first large studies to show this, the over 9,000 patient sweetheart registry. And among Minoka patients, there was a four-year death rate of 13%, recurrent MI 7%, heart failure 6%, stroke 4%, a 24% four-year rate of major adverse cardiovascular events. In the even larger Minoka reg um, study linked to cath PCI, so this is patients over the age of 65, got a one-year death rate of 12% recurrent MI1, heart failure 6, an 18% rate of one-year MACE. And in the largest meta-analysis, the one-year event rate is just under 10%. So again, it's not a good thing to have. People used to pat these patients on the head and tell them, don't worry, Anna, you didn't have a heart attack. But there are events that accrue, and the event itself is a true event. Predictors of adverse outcomes across studies are ST elevation, lower EF, and older age. Reinfarction after Minoka is interesting and may give us a clue about why those patients who appear to have normal coronaries and mild coronary disease may um, run together. In the Sweetheart Registry, there were 570 Minoka patients who had recurrent MI. And the first interesting thing is that only 340 of those went on to have a second angiogram. So in the remaining cases, I assume those docs thought they knew what they were dealing with, but they may not have. Because when an angiogram was done, about half had progressed to MI with obstructive coronary disease. And if we look at the bar graph on the right, we can see that no matter what the interval was between those two MI events, it was about half had progressed to MI with obstructive coronary disease, probably giving us a window into the initial event and showing that atherosclerotic disease may have been part of the equation. Once there was a second MI, there was no difference in mortality afterward, whether that second MI was again Minoka or MI with coronary disease. The best treatment of this problem is unknown. I hope I've convinced you it's an important problem that has adverse consequences for the patient. No treatment trials have been performed. And for now, we use mechanistic and observational data to guide the management. Current practice in secondary prevention medication use, and I know that this is somewhat old, but I don't really think it has shifted all that much today based on more recent smaller studies, is that Minoka patients in the light blue are less likely than MI with obstructive coronary disease patients in the dark blue to get all of the secondary prevention medications that we generally give. Less aspirin, way less P2Y12, less statin, less ASARP, less beta blocker. Is this the right amount or the wrong amount? Well, there's uncertainty about the application of post-MI treatment guidelines to these patients, and it's probably because there is known variability in the underlying mechanisms. Here then are all the potential mechanisms of Minoka. Minoka can be due to plaque rupture or plaque erosion. It can be due to coronary spasm. And you can see in this example, this patient has diffuse coronary spasm. It is rarely due to dissection. Sometimes it's thrombosis or thromboembolism without plaque. And then there are the overlap syndromes. Once we make these diagnoses, we no longer say that the patient has a diagnosis of Minoka. And those are Tuxedo syndrome and myocarditis. And here it's what we'll sometimes call surprise myocarditis. You didn't go into this cath thinking it was myocarditis, but then once the patient has a cardiac MR, surprise, it was myocarditis. And that comes up more than we might have thought. 
sometimes people find the differential diagnosis aspect of Minoka a little daunting. And I'll just remind you, there's always a differential diagnosis when somebody comes in with troponin that's elevated. So we can have patients who have stably elevated troponin, who have chronic myocardial injury, and maybe that's due to heart failure uh, or structural heart disease or CKD. You can even have dynamic troponin that can be without acute ischemia and might be due to acute heart failure or myocarditis. When there is acute ischemia, and we call it acute MI, well, we always recognize that that could be due to atherothrombosis or to supply demand imbalance, including things that increase demand or things that reduce supply, like coronary spasm. So when I think of the differential diagnosis of a typical MI, I'm thinking that it's mostly type 1 athero, but there's definitely a component of spasm, dissection, supply, demand, mismatch. Some MIs are just sudden death, just. Uh, some are stent thrombosis. Some are periprocedural, and rarely we see cases that turn out not to be in line. And we also know that there's this interplay between atherosclerosis and spasm and athero and supply demand mismatch. Certainly, if somebody's exposed to a tachyarrhythmia and they have a lot of athero that's obstructive in the background, they're more likely to show up with an MI. We also know that coronary angiography, though possibly the most important test we do in somebody with a myocardial infarction, is inherently limited because it shows us the lumen and not the wall of the artery. In this classic set of images, we see an angiogram on the left with two spots in the LAD that look really good. And then we have intravascular ultrasound on the right. Here's the IVUS catheter. This is the lumen, of course. And then we have intima media adventitia. And we see a lumen that's three millimeters at this spot. But when we look at the lower spot, the lumen is the same size. We saw that on the angiogram, but we see all this eccentrically remodeled plaque. So we're very familiar with this idea that the angiogram doesn't tell us the whole story. What about if there's a plaque rupture? Well, not all plaque rupture is angiographically evident either. Here is a schematic of a cross-section of a plaque with a necrotic core and smooth muscle and inflammatory cells. And if this plaque should rupture, like shown at the shoulder here, and you get a thrombus that looks like this, you're going to see an obstructive appearance on an angiogram. But if the thrombus instead looks like this, well, you might not see that at all, or it might look non-obstructive. And yet this thrombus can embolize and cause MI. Not all plaque erosion is angiographically evident either. Plaque erosion, of course, being a different plaque composition with more smooth muscle and proteoglycans and not a necrotic core. How common are these things in Minoka? Single center studies using IVUS or OCT demonstrated plaque rupture, erosion, or thrombus in somewhere between 29 and 50% of patients with Minoka. And in our recent multi-center study, Women's Heart, it was 43%. This is a lower rate than in STEMI, where it's most of the patients. It's higher than in asymptomatic patients with coronary disease where it's single digit per percentages, and it never happens in stable patients with ischemia and non-obstructive disease. In one study, myocarditis and coronary spasm were ruled out before they even did intracoronary imaging, and then the culprit rate's really high. But interestingly, the angiogram may not be as helpful as you might think. 30% of Minoka patients with normal angiograms and HARP had an OCT culprit lesion on core lab review, and the culprit was only located in the worst plaque on angiography half the time when present in our IVA study. Another diagnosis, coronary artery spasm. This is a common cause of Minoka, but it's a little hard to diagnose. If there's spontaneous spasm at cath, that may be helpful, but we also know spontaneous spasm happens just from the catheter. Provocative testing is not routinely done at the time of an acute angiogram, although we'll sometimes do it when it's a recurrent case and it's a low-risk second MI. Recent studies using provocative testing across the board in Minoka patients show that somewhere between a quarter and two-thirds will have inducible spasm. And when it's present, about half will have epicardial spasm, where you see a 90% stenosis in response to acetylcholine, and about the other third to half have microvascular spasm, where the artery doesn't narrow 90%, might not look different at all, but there's recapitulation of symptoms and EKG changes. Most patients with spasm also have non-obstructive coronary disease. A myocardial bridge may be a clue to spasm. In a study testing people with myocardial bridges, most of those um, will have spasm in that spot. And also a recent study shows that exposure to air pollution is independently associated with positive testing for spasm among non-obstructive ischemic heart disease patients. Predictors of coronary spasm in Minoka from one of the largest studies with testing show that the spasm patients were a little younger, a bit more likely to be male, more likely to have a typical chest pain, even though typical is kind of an outlawed word now, more likely to have prior chest pain or ST elevation, and the EF's a little higher. 
but not the usual coronary disease risk factors. Those don't select for people who don't have spasm. And peak troponin wasn't important either. So it's not that easy to pick these patients out. What about thrombosis or thromboembolism, thrombophilia? We have seen a number of cases in association with exogenous hormone use, whether it's to stop menstrual bleeding, um, high dose contraceptive pills for that reason, um, menopausal hormone therapy. And we've also, uh, others rather, have observed that factor V Leiden is present in nine to 15% of younger Minoka patients, and that's more than age and sex matched MICAD patients. Someone has reported that about a quarter of Minoka patients may have an inherited thrombophilia, and that's similar to cryptogenic stroke. But in my clinical practice, I see that there's some debate with the hematologist about whether this could even be related. Whenever I talk about factor V Leiden or protein CRS deficiency, they'll say back to me, you know, if there's not a PFO, this is a venous thromboembolic problem. It should not be arterial. So um, I think this is an evolving field. But when and nobody argues with antiphospholipid antibodies. And when there are antiphospholipid antibodies in an MI patient, about 20% had Minoka, and that's compared to a 6% overall rate. Coronary dissection is a cause of Minoka, but most dissection is not Minoka. And I think these two things get conflated because they both have a disproportionate impact on younger women. But I think it's important to separate them in our minds. Most dissection is an angiographic diagnosis. Like in this example, we see an abrupt change in caliber of the coronary here, and we see that change in caliber affects the entire rest of the vessel. The pathogenesis here is intramural hematoma. There's overlap if there is dissection and you have to diagnose it based on intracoronary imaging. Like in this example, where there's some narrowing here, the rest of the arteries look normal, and it's only on the OCT that we see this media adventitious split that's from dissection. This is probably single digit percentages of Minoka and probably the non-obstructive type of SCAD is about you know, 5% at most of that. But um, we'd know more if we did routine intracoronary imaging and potential dissection patients and no one wants to do that because it raises risk. Myocarditis is an alternate diagnosis and it's diagnosed based on cardiac MRI. A clinical presentation mimicking MI is common, and the CMR will have a diagnostic pattern of a non-ischemic late gadolinium enhancement look, like in this example where we have an epicardial strike. We have something that goes into the mid-myocardium outside of one coronary territory, and it'll have matching edema showing it's acute. This type of pattern is present in somewhere between 15% and a third of patients clinically diagnosed as Minoka, and it's more common in patients who have angiographically normal coronaries among men and in younger patients. The earlier the scan, the more likely myocarditis will be identified. And this is a reason to prioritize early cardiac MRI for these patients, because you want to find this for the patient and they no longer need any of the usual secondary prevention stuff after they get through the acute episode treatment is supportive. Takasubo syndrome could be its own talk. And I think it will be a little controversial in time to come whether this is MI or not. It's a reversible left ventricular dysfunction syndrome that presents like Minoka, and the diagnosis may be suspected based on the wall motion pattern and triggering by stress, but a cath is still needed. I think there are some who would prefer CT angiography, but I feel that you still need a cath because acute MI can cause a similar wall motion pattern, and there are mimics. Um, CMR may be useful to tell you it's not an infarction. Every so often, there's a surprise, and sometimes the Takasubo pattern is really from coronary spasm, from left main or LAD GAD. Uh, left main or LAD occult plaque rupture, or even hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with afterload mismatch. Some of the folks who talk about it as a neurohormonal stunning phenomenon exclusively will say that there, it's mediated by spasm, either microvascular, uh, microvascular or multivessel transient. And if the spasm is a part of it, then I think it could be argued it's MI. But I think we'll leave Takatsubo there. So that's a whole range of underlying causes of MI. How many Minoka patients have each underlying cause? The answer is important if we're ever going to do treatment trials, because if the treatment of this is completely disparate, which patients are we supposed to select for a trial? And if we put everybody in, aren't we going to dilute a potential treatment effect and not really understand it? It's important for interim treatment. We need to treat patients now. And it's important for patient counseling because I suspect the same thing is happening to you. These patients will come to me and say, do I need all this stuff when they're discharged on the usual you know, four or five medication? And I would like to be able to answer. If we treat Minoka based on underlying cause, what would it look like? Well, the patients who have an active plaque presumably get antiplatelet therapy and statins. Those who have spasm will have calcium channel blockers and nitrates as the central components of their treatment. If it's coronary dissection, we're not sure how to treat that, 
but maybe beta blockade, maybe no antiplatelet, and certainly no statin. If it's from thrombosis, a thromboembolism will look for the source and treat with an antiplatelet or anticoagulant. So there's a certain amount of separation here. And if it's Takotsubo syndrome, we're not sure how to treat that either, but observational studies would suggest RAS blockade. And if it's myocarditis, supportive therapy. How then can we make the diagnosis of the underlying cause? In the American Heart Association scientific statement, we have this sort of a traffic light diagram. And it looks a little busy, but it basically separates things into three steps. First, are we sure this was an MI? If we see non-obstructive coronary disease, do we want to go back and think about pulmonary embolism or another non-cardiac cause of troponin elevation? But if we otherwise have somebody who meets the universal definition, and we don't think it's a known non-cardiac cause, then we have what we call a working diagnosis of Minoka. And it pays to look back dispassionately at that angiogram again, because we can miss things quickly in the cath lab, like dissection of a branch vessel, or a cutoff of a branch vessel that's from embolism, or maybe there was some obstructive coronary disease in Syria that could have been missed. We look again and say, could this be a cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo syndrome? And then you're supposed to get a cardiac MRI and this point in the thinking process to say, maybe it's not really MI, maybe it was myocarditis. Once we've done at least the review of angiography and an LV functional assessment, we say, okay, this patient has Minoka. And we wanna think about doing additional testing to sort out why this particular Minoka happened. Our options are intracoronary imaging, assessment for spasm, or both. And sometimes, even with everything, we don't know. And then we call it an unclassified Minoka. In order to try to figure out how common each of these underlying causes was, we embarked on the Women's Heart Attack Research Program, focusing initially on women because the syndrome has a predilection for women. This was funded by the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women Strategically Focused Research Network and established our Center for Women's Research. Our objectives were to determine the frequency of vascular causes of Minoka on intracoronary optical coherence tomography. We wanted to find myocardial abnormalities on CMR, whether ischemic or not, and basically figure out how often each patient had each underlying cause. We started with women with MI referred for cath with the intent to perform PCI. And we say it this way just to point out that we're not looking at patients who probably had myocarditis and we're just checking. These were patients who were really thought to have an MI from coronary disease. If they had an alternate explanation for troponin elevation, they were not enrolled. They got a study consent and then they got a clinical cath. If they had MI with coronary disease or angiographic evidence of dissection, they did not have research imaging. But if they had Minoka, they were to get three vessel OCT and cardiac MRI within a week with a detailed mapping protocol. The core laboratories were blinded to detailed clinical information and the results of the other imaging tests. The OCT core lab was run by Dr. Akiko Maihara at CRF, the CMR core lab led by Dr. Raymond Huang at Brigham and Wingman's, and the Angio core lab by Dr. Ziad Ali at CRF. We had 301 women with a clinical diagnosis of MI at 16 sites. 170 of them proved to have Minoka and 23 had contraindications to OCT, like a contrast allergy. Two were not interpretable, so we had 145 OCT studies, and 116 of those patients came back for their cardiac MR. Our women had a median age of 60. About half were other than white non-Hispanic. About half had hypertension. Some had diabetes. The median peak troponin on a conventional assay was just under one, so that was 17 times the upper limit of normal as a median. We did not have a lot of STEMI patients. That's something we would like to do differently in HARP2 if we can. Um, about half had a wall motion abnormality. About half had a normal angiogram, but the core lab didn't see those angiograms as normal. The ad called a median of 30% stenosis. Here are the OCT findings. 46% of the women with Minoka had an OCT culprit lesion as detected by the core lab. And most of those were either plaque rupture or the early sequela of plaque rupture. And I'll show you examples. A few had thrombus, a few had a, a signature of spasm, and one had scab. I'll show you a bunch of OCT images. So let me landmark you with a normal OCT. This is the OCT catheter. It rides with a guide wire and OCT images radially. So there's a radial shadow behind the guide wire. This first orange band is the media. The lumen has been cleared by contrast because OCT uses light. So you have to be able to see through. Dark band is the media, and then there's the adventitia and perivascular tissue. This three-layer appearance is normal. Here is a case with plaque rupture. We can see that there's some intimal thickening here, and then we get a lot of signal dropout, which is because plaque is sort of smudgy and doesn't let light through. This is the guide wire in the shadow. And we can see these little lakes of contrast in the plaque because there's been a rupture event. 
Here there is lipidic plaque where it's just very smudgy. And this thing that looks like kissy lips is a thrombus that's on top of that plaque. Over here, and I'm sorry for the arrowhead, it's rotated. Um, we can see a defect. So this is a plaque rupture. The earliest sequela on pathologic studies and OCT of plaque rupture is an intraplaque cavity, also called intraplaque hemorrhage. And we can see the crescent of low attenuation. It's not quite as attenuated as the lipidic plaque. This is the, a rupture that has sealed. And I think you can see at the arrowhead that that cap looks very thin. The next step is to put down some new material interior to the rupture. So this is a layered plaque. It has the smudgy uh, lipidic plaque, and then there's a new layer put inside, but you can kind of see that there is a little track that is healing through that plaque. We had no major complications of OCT in this study, but we had transient spasm in a lot of patients. So there are these uh, active plaques that we found in heart, but the trick is that people are often used to looking for the type of thing they see in MI with coronary disease. And what I want to show you here by putting these side by side is that the general morphology is fairly similar. It's just that the lumens are bigger and it's less dramatic in a Minoka patient. So if you're looking only for this kind of giant plaque rupture with a huge cavity, as we see in MICAD patients, we don't see that. Yes, we see lipidic plaque, we see a defect in the plaque, we see thrombus on top of it, but it's not going to be a huge evacuated cavity. Intraplaque cavity looks really similar, and I'll show you this more proximal slice here, looks a lot like our plaque, uh, intraplaque hemorrhage, but our cap is thinner, as you might expect. Um, and this has a lot more plaque, circumferential plaque, smaller lumen. The layered plaque, which is also shown to be an acute um, type of plaque in many cases, very similar, just more arc of plaque in the uh, MICAD example and a smaller lumen. About intraplaque hemorrhage, I'll mention that autopsy findings show again that this is an acute thing. This is a cause of sudden death and myocardial infarction. Here's an example. We can see on this pathologic image that there's hemorrhage into the plaque and we can see that there should be a connection. But if you look at a microscopic level, it has sealed. So there's only this little bit of current penetration of blood into the wall. And that goes along with the OCT appearance where we will not see a communication with the lumen. And that is an important uh, phenomenon. We've shown through HARP that this is associated with corresponding MRI changes. Clinical correlates of an OCT culprit lesion were diabetes, abnormal angiogram, and older age, but they're not striking enough and not peak troponin or the vessel level angiographic stenosis severity. I had thought that vessels with more severe plaque would be the ones we should interrogate looking for culprit lesions. And there's a trend there, but it doesn't bear out. The more vessels imaged, the more likely there was a culprit lesion. And remember that these are mostly non-STEMI patients and in non-STEMI in general, it can be hard to be sure about the culprit. Looking across studies of intracoronary imaging in Minoka, we're sort of right in the center. It looks like the rate is somewhere around 50% as we look across studies. The lessons are OCT culprit lesion in 30% of angiograms rated as normal by sites. The more vessels imaged, the more culprits are found. And HARP and other studies show that culprit vessels are harder to identify than we think. Now let's turn to the cardiac MRI findings. We saw infarction in 33%, and here is an example. Uh, on the left, late gadolinium enhanced imaging. On the right, T2-weighted imaging showing us myocardial edema. Obviously, white is abnormal in both. And we see here a subendocardial to transmural myocardial infarction. This is one of the bigger ones going base to apex. And it has a corresponding area of edema that even goes beyond the area of infarction. That's the area at risk. Almost all of our MIs were acute based on myocardial edema. Some patients, 21%, had a regional injury pattern. And that means that they did not have late gadolinium enhancement, but they had myocardial edema within a coronary territory. And in this example, there's even a wall motion abnormality to go along with that. 21% of patients had non-ischemic findings, as in this case of myocarditis, where there were multiple foci of late gadolinium enhancement with skip lesions and the thing in the septum going outside a coronary territory with matching T2-weighted hyperintensity and 26% were normal. Correlates of a cardiac MRI abnormality were peak troponin, creatinine, and diastolic blood pressure, but not the presence of an OCT culprit lesion or angiographic stenosis severity. Shorter time from MI to cardiac MRI made it more likely that you'd get an abnormal study, 
the median infarct size was 3.8 grams. We were unable to identify a troponin threshold below which there was a very low likelihood of abnormal cardiac MRI. And we had hoped that we would be able to say, look, that troponin is so low, don't even bother. But we couldn't say that. Now, when we put these things together, we get some new insights. So here are the patients who had a cardiac MR. We have 51 with an OCT culprit lesion, 65 without. And the first thing is that as we look vertically, we see that MI or regional myocardial injury, those ischemic findings are present in 69% of the patients who had an OCT culprit lesion showing that these really are causing MI. And as we look across that MI or regional injury, we see that about half had no OCT culprit lesion. And we think these are related to thromboembolic disease or spasm, but we didn't do spasm testing at heart. Looking across studies at cardiac MRI and the likelihood of finding a myocardial infarction it varies, and we can see that now there is a second study that has added myocardial edema in the definition, which makes sense. It's within a coronary territory. It's um, If we do experimental studies, you can see that lighting up this area at risk is the first thing that happens when you occlude a coronary. Um, so that is quite logical, and we see that when you add myocardial edema, you get a rate around 50% of myocardial infarction. If we require only late gadolinium enhancement, then the likelihood is about a quarter of finding MI on cardiac MRI. The rate of a non-ischemic cardiac MR diagnosis varies widely from 20 to 50%, and that depends a lot on the selection criteria. We're one of the studies that has a lower rate, and I think it's because we were so focused on taking patients who were sent to the cath lab because they were believed to have MI with coronary disease. Key findings then from women's HARP using multimodality imaging in women with Minoka. 64% of Minoka had imaging evidence of MI, whether on OCT, MRI, or both. 21% had a non-ischemic alternate cause, so 85% had a cause identified overall. Uh, OCT and cardiac MRI provided useful diagnostic information independently and in uh, combination. And the findings correlated well, showing that these non-obstructive culprit lesions are causative. We think that spasm or thromboembolism caused those MIs or regional injury cases that did not have an OCT culprit. So ultimately, the mechanisms of Minoco were often similar to mechanisms of MI with coronary disease, atherothrombosis with a possible contribution of spasm. And I'm asked a number of questions about this that come up frequently. So one is, if the thrombus is not occlusive, why is there myonecrosis if there's a plaque rupture or erosion? And we saw two MRI patterns that I think are instructive in trying to answer this question. One was this regional edema. So here's an example of anterior wall, anterior septum, and apex regional edema, large territory of risk. This is an LAD plaque rupture patient. So clearly, that artery was at some point compromised. I think this is often due to superimposed spasm. In theory, it could have been transient thrombosis with spontaneous thrombolysis. But OCT is pretty sensitive for thrombus, and we don't see giant thrombi here. There's not a lot of thrombus. So I think that superimposed spasm is more likely. Plus, we have these spasm studies showing us that there is a lot of spasm in Minoka. So I think this is, in a sense, um, approaching the elephant from different directions, and there's a little bit of both in there. The other pattern we saw commonly was that there wasn't a large area of regional edema or a large MI. We saw these small, embolic-looking MIs. And I'll bring you back to the idea of that cross-section of a plaque that I showed you the schematic of. If there's a small thrombus there and it embolizes, you would get an appearance that looks like this. The other question I get is, well, if it's truly an MI, why is there no late gadolinium enhancement in some cases? The MR is very sensitive for late gadolinium enhancement, but if you think about it, the myocytes that are dying have to be close together for you to be able to see them. And if we look again at this regional injury case, I can imagine that some subendocardial myocytes over here might be dying to make that troponin, a few over here, a few over there. They're not coalesced in a way that's going to light up as an infarct. So that's related to the spatial distribution. But also, I think if that artery had been occluded for longer, then by the time of the angiogram, we would have seen an obstructed appearance. So it's partly about the dynamics of the artery. Um, regional edema is an earlier sign of injury. I may explain this as well. So that answers a few questions, but we've got a lot more questions. Why do female MI patients have Minoka more often than males? Well, we'd like to do this multimodality study now in men and women. Are the mechanisms different between men and women? Not only will we have imaging, but we will have a blood biorepository, and we want to get an in-depth understanding of specific imaging findings and how they relate to clinical features, but also biomarkers and genetics, trying to elucidate the pathways that lead to Minoka. 
we'd love to be able to target imaging to specific patients. These imaging studies are not widely available for everyone. They might not be available in a timely manner. A larger sample size will strengthen those analyses of predictors. And so we're doing HARP 2.0, enrolling 200 additional men and women with Minoka. You guys are an enrolling center, as you heard from Dr. Sandoval. Thank you to Dr. Sandoval and Drs. Cavalcante and Brilakis so that we can get more patients um, into HARP. And I hope that you will refer your patients. Here are the current HARP study sites. We were sort of hitting the east and west coast there and going upon Canada, so we need to get to the heartland, and we're happy to have you. The imaging study design is very much like what we did before, but including men. Patients with MI referred for CAS, they can't have prior obstructive coronary disease, so no stents or surgery. If you're getting consent pre-CAS, you get these stress questionnaires, they have their clinical CAS and biorepository samples, again, if they turn out to have am I with coronary disease, dissection, or if you're sure it's Takasubo, they screen fail, they get no research imaging. But if they have Minoka, they're to have three-vessel OCT and cardiac MRI on a prioritized time frame in order to see as much edema as we can. And then they get followed up for events every six months, but this is low-intensity follow-up. It can be virtual or in-person. The inclusion criteria are basically universal definition of MI. Exclusion criteria, prior center surgery, alternate explanation for troponin elevation, and I'll show you that this can be a judgment call. Um, recent cocaine or other vasospastic agents, if you really think that was the cause right now. Um, GFR too low for contrast or thrombolytic therapy for STEMI. What do I mean by alternate explanation for troponin elevation in the eligibility criteria? And it's also in the MI definition. There are some clinical scenarios that are clearly um, the reason for the abnormal troponin. And the example I like to give is if somebody has critical AS, they run for a bus, they pass out, they make a troponin. Well, yes, myocytes are dying, but nobody thinks that's a heart attack from a vascular cause. Um, so that's clearly not going to be somebody we would put in this study, even if they had open arteries, we know the reason. But something like arrhythmia is harder to uh, differentiate. So, you know, give me a uh, 85 year old who gets an SVT at a rate of 180, um, if they have, and it goes on for three hours, if they have normal coronaries, I still feel like this was a supply and demand issue. And I don't need to hypothesize a vascular problem, even if you send that patient for CAS. Um, but give me a 40 year old with an SVT at 150 for 30 minutes, that's not really supposed to make a substantial kind of troponin. So there's a certain amount of judgment required. And when um, patients are presented to me for me to consider in the study, I'll say, if the arteries are completely normal, do I think I know exactly why that troponin was elevated without additional testing? It's not always so obvious. And here's a case example we had early on in the study that illustrates this. This was a 44-year-old woman with anemia and heavy menstrual bleeding. She had a hemoglobin of seven, two weeks prior to presentation. Now she comes with two hours of chest pain. She looks fine. She's 44. She has subtle inferior ST elevation, less than one millimeter, with a troponin on the old assay that was 0.09. But then she got transfused, her troponin went up, and she still had chest pain. So then she gets a cath, and to everyone's surprise, she has no risk factor. She's got a 30 to 40% proximal LED narrowing, and there's some ectasia. And in the interest of time, I'm not showing you the angiogram, but the LED wraps well around the apex, going halfway up the inferior wall. OCT showed plaque rupture in her with thrombosis. These are proximal, actually, yeah, distal to proximal, going left to right. And this is the OCT catheter, guide wire, and the shadow. This thing is an artifact, but this serpiginous tract into the plaque, that's an intimal disruption. And this is a lipid rich plaque. We see a thrombus coming in here. It meets criteria at this slice for a thin cap fibroatheroma. And there's a bigger thrombus as we continue to pull back in this vessel. So this was a surprise. Nobody was really expecting this in this patient. And on her cardiac MRI, there's an infarct. You can see one of these embolic appearing small transmural infarcts in the inferior wall. And this is right where the LAD ended. So this is basically what I showed you in the schematic with the small thrombus on a plaque rupture that embolizes to the end of the vessel. And this case was instructive for a lot of reasons for us. One, um, nobody was expecting a plaque rupture and a thrombus in this woman with heavy menstrual bleeding. But some of the clinical team were sure this was a supply demand mismatch problem. But the clues were the hemoglobin's not that low. She's young enough that she should be able to sustain that without making a troponin that was so elevated. Um, there, so, and she's still having chest pain after a transfusion. So supply demand mismatch, it really didn't hold water here. The ST changes were inferior and the infarct is inferior, but the problem's in the LAD. So if we hadn't been doing three vessel imaging in this patient, we would have missed it because I think people would have imaged the right and the circumflex. Um, so there are a lot of instructive findings here. Don't be so quick to um, 
chalk it up to supply demand mismatch. There's no way this woman's getting antiplatelet and statins without this imaging. So this is a nice case. But they're not all like that. This is the case I just showed you. Here's two more cases. Similarly aged woman, similar uh, troponin elevation, also mild LED stenosis. This one proved to be a dissection that was not angiographically uh, obvious. And she had an LED territory MI. And here's one who's a little older and her blood pressure is higher. She's got a little more ST elevation and a slightly higher troponin. She had some spasm, but as soon as intracoronary nitro was given, she had mild LED stenosis. And she turns out to have a lipidic plaque with layering. Unless you think that is a chronic problem and this is an old thing, here's her MI. It's gigantic. And the T2-weighted imaging shows it is acute. So we get totally different imaging findings depending on the patient. Um, this idea that there can be an alternate diagnosis on cardiac MRI in Minoka, it's not unique to non-obstructive disease. This is a nice consecutive series of patients with non-STEMI. And when they thought they could identify the infarct-related artery, MRI proved them wrong in some cases. Sometimes it was a different infarct-related artery. And in fact, sometimes it, there was single vessel disease. So of course, the researchers picked the single vessel as a likely culprit. But in fact, it was Minoka because a different territory had an infarct. And in 12.5% of these cases, there was an alternate diagnosis entirely, even though there was coronary disease. Some patients really had myocarditis or Takotsubo or amyloid. So this idea of a differential diagnosis, again, is not unique to Minoka. When I put this all together, I think, okay, MI with coronary disease, mostly type 1, some type 2. We've talked about this, but some is not MI. And with Minoka, there's athero and an athero culprit in, let's say, about half. There's more type 2. Some is still MI with sudden death. We showed that in the autopsy study. More of it is not MI, and there's some with an unknown mechanism. How does prognosis relate to the Minoka underlying cause? Well, atherosclerotic culprit lesions may be associated with a poorer prognosis than no culprit on OCT, and you can see these are athero culprit lesions and freedom from MACE here. A meta-analysis of cardiac MRI findings in Minoka finds that the patients who are found to have true MI have a worse prognosis than those with myocarditis or Takotsubo syndrome. But keep in mind that a normal cardiac MR can happen with plaque rupture. Patients with a normal cardiac MR are still considered to have Minoka, and the later you image, the less likely you are to find something. Over the long term, probably those patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy are at the highest risk. MI or myocarditis may be middle, uh, in this study. And normal CMR, this is why I'm showing it to you, normal CMR, although it's still considered Minoka, seems to have an excellent 10-year prognosis. Now, in that study that also includes regional edema, we can start to see that regional edema in the blue has a poorer prognosis than normal CMR, but infarct has a poorer prognosis than just regional edema. Still, the amount of edema, the extent of edema or of infarct is associated with worse prognosis for every segment and increase in risk. Getting a diagnosis also matters to the patient on a very um, personal level. So among 200 patients with a median follow-up of two years, these patients will go for more testing if they don't, so this is the opposite, I'm sorry, um, there is less testing in the people who get a diagnosis made. Um, the people who don't have a diagnosis keep coming back worried about their symptoms. How should Minoka be managed then? There are ESC guidelines on acute coronary syndrome that include Minoka, and there's a class one recommendation for cardiac MR. It's also a class 2A in the 2021 chest pain guidelines. You're supposed to manage according to an established underlying diagnosis and use a diagnostic algorithm to get there. And that diagnostic algorithm looks a lot like what we're doing in HARP. The ESC guidelines will say that secondary prevention therapy should be considered for those with evidence of coronary disease and to control risk factors. Should every patient with Minoka have cardiac MR? Well, I mentioned to you that in HARP, we saw that there was no lower bound of troponin that made the MRI no longer useful. And that was true in another study where they say, okay, this is the highest yield subset, shorter CMR interval, higher troponin. But look at the longer interval after two weeks and a lower troponin. And this is a pretty low high sensitivity troponin, still half are diagnostic. This is an observational study of secondary prevention after Minoka from Sweetheart. They constructed propensity score matched cohorts by medical treatment and followed for four years. All of the red lines are patients selected by their physicians for treatment with that class of agents and the blue are selected for no treatment. And we can see that statins are associated with lower risk of MACE and follow-up. Selection for ACE-ARB is associated with lower risk. 
selection for beta blocker tended to be associated with lower risk. And for this composite endpoint, no difference in DAPT, although DAPT and beta blockade tended to be associated with lower old cause mortality in Minoga patients as well. There are two ongoing studies I'd like to highlight quickly. One is StratMed Minoka, and this is a randomization of veronolactone to and control in patients with elevated IMR. There's a precision medicine study basically trying to see if angina status is different if you follow an algorithm like the HARP algorithm or just use usual care. But we definitely need more clinical trials in order to get answers for our patients. I see I'm short on time, so I'm gonna fly through the last few slides. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the basic science stuff. What role do platelets play in Minoka? And in theory, platelets could be really important because we have all these patients with non-obstructive plaque, and we know that athero progresses over time through repeated cycles of rupture and healing. But most of these events are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. If the plaques get larger, it's more likely that a small thrombus is going to bring this to clinical attention because of the diminution in blood flow. But there are certainly some people who have small plaque ruptures and they're clinically silent, and other patients have small plaque ruptures and they come in with Minoka, and we'd really like to understand the difference. So my colleague Jeffrey Berger is doing a basic science study collecting blood from patients with Minoka and with MI with coronary disease, along with non-obstructive control. And his mentee, Tessa Barrett, has shown that you can use platelet RNA sequencing. It will separate controls from MI pretty well. We can see there are a lot of differentially expressed transcripts. And the top hits in these platelets are things that are related to thrombosis. So that makes sense. The MI patients have activated platelets. But when we look at MICUD versus Minoka, we again see pretty good separation and differentially expressed transcripts. But now the top hits are related to inflammation. Net signaling, neuroinflammation, nitric oxide. So this is an area of active investigation and we need more samples and more patients with more imaging in order to sort this out. She's looked at whole blood RNA sequencing as well and we see that one of the top differentially expressed transcripts between Minoka and control and Minoka and MICAD is related to estrogen, which is really thought provoking because women are more likely to get Minoka than men. The take home points then, Minoka, is it MI? Yes, about two thirds of the time. And you might say to your patient, you had heart attack with open arteries or Minoka. More testing might help us figure out why this happened to you and might help me understand which medications you need. These patients can look very similar on the outside and we need advanced imaging in order to sort them into categories. Invasive testing is important. Coronary CT will detect plaque but not rupture, erosion, or thrombus. It doesn't have the resolution. And a CMR defined impact in part could be from spasm or it could be from active plaque. The identification of the underlying diagnosis will facilitate tailoring of therapy. Intracoronary imaging is usually done during the diagnostic angio, but it could be done afterwards, especially if there's an ischemic CMR finding. Spasm testing is usually reserved for patients with persistent chest pain, but it could be considered acutely if the suspicion is high as in a recurrent event and the patient is stable. The ESC algorithm also mentions that if there's no clear culprit lesion, you should be doing intravascular imaging, including OCT. And that's a class 2B recommendation and would, in theory, involve all Minoka. Um, CMR for everyone. The key role is to rule out myocarditis and other non-ischemic causes. It's important to tell the patient from the outset that the cardiac MR is needed to guide treatment because they often need to come back for this. The CMR is ideally performed in the first few days, but it still adds value more than two weeks later. And a normal CMR is still considered Minoka unless you find another cause, but it may be associated with better prognosis than abnormal CMR. How do I treat when the underlying diagnosis is uncertain as it stands today? I give antiplatelet therapy. I give a statin unless I'm totally sure there's no athero. I give calcium blockade in case there was spasm. I give ACE ARB based on sweetheart. And because that's so many drugs, I tend to reserve beta blockade for infarct on MRI, a low EF, or if I suspect dissection. Um, that was a whirlwind, I know. Um, I hope there'll be a few questions. Please refer your patients for the HARP study. And I'd like to thank Dr. Sandoval and Dr. Cavalcante and Brilakis for taking this on uh, and you guys for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Harmony. That was a wonderful presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks for making our Monday morning uh, worthwhile, Harmony, and for all your work in the in this arena. I I just wonder with what you've presented to us that the term Minoka itself is a bit misleading, because what you're proposing really, in many cases, is the artery was at one time obstructed or at least maybe one of the capillary beds. So I I just like to hear your comment about that. <laughs> 
I completely agree with you. I think this is a term that has a place and it's sort of, it's got a, a, a place in our learning as we evolve from saying this was never an MI to just this is one type of MI. And I think that ultimately we are going to be talking about what causes that particular presentation and not how what percent stenosis there was in the artery at the time of the angiogram. I think this is sort of a way station to a better understanding through more research. To follow up on that, <clears throat> Herman, I do have a question. Do you think the present uh, it, uh, the present tabulation of myocardial infarction definition and the universal definition of MI, it, does that serve well of my NOCA patients? Is that a, uh, the proper tabulation? I, I, I like how you present that there in MI, CAD versus my NOCA. Uh, should there be more emphasis on that differentiation in future iterations? I'm, ju I'm just curious on your thoughts and on the present tabulation and how we should move forward. I think so. I think ultimately we want, through this imaging, we wind up sorting people into more universal definition of MI categories. I think those categories make more sense, right? You can have type one MI and maybe it shows up with obstructive disease, or maybe you don't realize it's type one until you've done intracoronary imaging. And then you see that there is a black rupture and a thrombus. Um, and then, you know, the type two includes spasm and dissection. We often think about it as supply demand mismatch, but there are true vascular causes in there. They're just not athero. And then there are some cases that are instead myocardial injury and just takes more testing to figure that out. But that's why I like that cardiac MR study, the serial cardiac MR and the MICAD non-STEMIs, because you kind of have to think about these alternate diagnoses in everybody. So yeah, I agree with you totally. Other questions in the room in the meantime? So I'll ask something else here. You know, of course, there's a heart protocol, uh, but clinically, what do you think is the timing of this, uh, you know, there was, um, I, I want to say a study in the Netherlands looking at patients with MI with increased high sensitivity troponin that did MRI first. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and I'm just curious, uh, as we learn more about this, what do you think it's the, the sequence uh, of, of events here? That is a very challenging question, because I definitely believe in prompt angiography. But, you know, let's talk STEMI, non-STEMI. So for STEMI, I would advocate that it, when you know what the culprit vessel is, in theory, I'm not an interventional cardiologist, so easy for me to say, I assume none of the risk. Um, but I think you should be doing intracoronary imaging in those STEMI patients if you don't see an obstructive lesion, because it's a very different story for the patient if you're telling them maybe this is a false alarm call versus you just had a non-obstructive plaque rupture. And it's easier to know what the culprit is in STEMI. So I am, and ST elevation is a harbinger of increased risk in Minoka patients. So um, I feel that that's a place that the field should move. For non-STEMI patients, not as obvious where the culprit lesion is. And I think that it's instructive to figure out for the patient if there is a culprit lesion. Again, you have to know what you're looking for. Um, but it winds up being three vessel OCT, ideally for the reasons that I've shown you. With that in mind, then, if there are cases that you think are high likelihood for myocarditis, but you're not sure, and maybe my patient, the 44-year-old with the menstrual bleeding, maybe might have been one of those, or you're not sure what it is, I think it might be useful to get the MRI first if there's no rush to do an angiogram. And that might be able clinically to help us target imaging for the future. Or maybe we see myocarditis and it's clear, and maybe that patient in theory doesn't even need a cath, they could get a CT. Um, the trouble that we have is the inherent order of the way that we do things. We generally will do an angiogram before we get an MRI, and it might be more helpful if we could somehow flip that. It's just not our usual routine. Does that answer your question, John? Yes. <clears throat> yes, no, that was great. Any other questions in the room or in the chat that we, that we have? You have one in the chat there. Uh, so we have a question from Dr. Cavalcante, who, who was able to join us online here. He's, he's asking, could you please elaborate on the importance of early CMR in these patients? Oh, yes. It is definitely important to get it earlier. I'm showing you slides saying get it anytime, get it with low troponin, um, because sometimes there is a wait. But the likelihood of finding myocardial edema is higher early and of making a diagnosis of myocarditis in particular is higher early. So we would then convert somebody from, we're shrugging our shoulders and saying, we're not sure what happened to you to, oh yes, I know what it is. You have edema in the LAD coronary territory. It looks like it was a vascular thing, helps us tailor therapy. The earlier the CMR, the better. Ideally, it's done in the inpatient setting next day or same day after cath because edema starts to wane pretty quickly. And we're almost done, but let me ask you one final question here. So the um, in, in these patients with Minoka, um, you know, I, I think sometimes there's, um, uh, as you pointed out, the status quo of like, oh, normal coronaries, particularly if 
no comprehensive evaluation is done and you know it's all good follow up with your primary care but should we follow these patients in cardiology uh what's your protocol at nyu do you follow them in the cardiology practice and, and on that same note do you offer them uh, uh coronary microvascular dysfunction testing in the future in some of these patients uh, they absolutely need a cardiologist. They had an MI and they have a 24% four-year rate of major adverse cardiovascular events. So to pass them off to primary care, uh, I think would be a big mistake unless you happen to have extremely clued in primary care physicians. And that would be your usual practice with any other MI patient, which it generally is in the US. So absolutely, these patients need a cardiologist and they need a cardiologist who's going to just be thoughtful about what the differential diagnosis is here and not anchor on one thing and say, yeah, you're fine. Um, and then what was your other question there? You said, oh, about uh, microvascular testing. Yeah. I generally will offer invasive coronary function testing to patients who have persistent chest pain. And in my experience, they almost all have coronary spasms. So if they keep coming back with chest pain, they almost always have spasms. They're nitrate responsive. They do really well with calcium blockers. Either I haven't given them before or I intensify them if the patients have recurrent chest pain. And a lot of patients will want to know what that pain is and we'll go back for function testing here. And the hit rate on spasm is very high, so high that I feel like maybe I'm not referring enough patients because I can't, it can't always be. Um, seems like there's two oh. questions. Seems like there's two questions in the chat. Well, um, uh, I, I don't identify the name from the second one, but it says, does microvascular testing have a role in evaluating new HEF-REF with no epicardial coronary artery disease? I think that's a, a slightly different topic, but but yes. Uh, let me try anyway. Um, I have always worried about microvascular testing in people who have a reason for abnormal microvasculature. For example, in patients with Minoga, if we do microvascular testing early, it's very often abnormal. And then you don't know, is it because there was myocardial edema or infarct and it's compressing the microvasculature? So that microvasculature was fine right before the MI, but now it's a problem. Or is that it does that really signify that the microvessels are the problem? And you can't separate that. So if we do microvascular testing, we wait until we think edema has resolved and we still have that question in our mind. For HEFREF, I would have the same concern. If somebody's got a reduced ejection fraction and very high wall stress, I am not sure that we can really understand what the microvasculature is contributing at this moment or uh, contributed at the beginning, I guess I should say, um, by doing testing now. And... So I'm not trying to write tools for this. And one other question in the chat here from Dr. Sadat is, is, is there a relation to elevated LPA? Mm, that is a great question. And we should definitely uh, look at that with additional blood samples in heart. It seems likely, right? If there's enhanced thrombosis in some patients, maybe, maybe that's related to LPA. Well, this was wonderful. Harmony, thank you so much for, for this presentation. Thank you to Dr. Reynolds. And, and we really look forward to partnering in, in, in HARP with you moving forward. Thank you so much. Here, thanks for having me.